Robots Radio presents... In 2003, Pixar Studios gave the world an uplifting adventure that taught us all to just keep swimming. In 2020, we just keep moving through a flight from a friend. The film is Finding Nemo. The whiskey is Four Roses Small Batch Select. And we'll review them both. This is the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2003 film, Finding Nemo. What's that? I know what that is. Oh, oh, Sandy Plank and someone. He called, he said it was called uh, a butt. Wow, that's a pretty big butt. But before we get there, Brad, I want to take a second and just go back to last week's episode where we talked about Sofia Coppola's film Lost in Translation. Now, neither one of us was actually like a really huge fan of that movie, and I think you actually liked it less than I did. Uh, But what we found is that this movie struck a chord with a lot of people, and we've heard from quite a few people out there in Film and Whiskey Nation that this is a really beloved movie. And so I thought we should at least kind of comment on it and maybe hear a counter argument. And who better to offer a counter argument than the person who puts us in our place better than anyone else, our frequent co-host, Jen Lowers. Jen actually wrote in and left a couple messages for us uh, to read on air where she argues her case for why Lost in Translation is so great. So she says she was writing this as she was listening and she says, I'm only about five minutes into the podcast so far. But the reason this film seems meandering or boring to me is that this is exactly what it's actually like to live in Japan as a foreigner. Jen, actually, this is an aside. She lived in Japan uh, just briefly for a few months period, but she went through exactly what Bill Murray was going through in this movie. She said it can be remarkably uneventful and boring aside from the whole falling in love with a random stranger aspect This movie captures as closely as I could possibly tell to what it's like to actually live there as a foreigner. Essentially, after I got back from Japan, I rewatched this movie and I was like, yep, pretty much spot on. People's perceptions of life abroad are often really glamorous, but this film does a good job of capturing both the positives and negatives of feeling so isolated in a foreign country. Living there for a few months had its ups and downs. Everything was new and beautiful, but there are few people you can communicate with and many things you don't see and you don't understand. A lot of sitting around and just not having connections with people. I totally get where you guys are coming from, and this movie probably isn't even in my top 100 or even 250 best films of all time list, but it's a personal favorite now because it resonates so deeply with a huge part of my life. Yeah, honestly, I I don't think we considered it from the angle of how does this movie reflect real life experience? And that's probably a big angle that we missed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's something that I think any movie can have that sort of personal connection to. I've never had the experience of living abroad. I, I have to imagine that you do feel that sense of isolation where you're surrounded by people. But those those barriers of language and and culture can really keep you feeling lonely even in a crowded place so thanks again jen for kind of pointing out those personal connections that you have to the film and you know when you consider it from that aspect brad i really do think the movie did a a pretty good job of demonstrating that all right so with that said what do you say we get into talking about finding nemo brad i have to say when we have movies like this come up on the podcast movies that are just fun and colorful and and pretty light-hearted I really enjoy doing episodes like this. I feel like we've been in kind of a downer rut here for the last few weeks with uh, 2001 and Lost in Translation. And it's really refreshing to just watch a movie that I'm already familiar with, a movie that I know I like. It it has some really deep messages to it, but overall, it's just a fun movie. Bob, I I don't know if I could disagree more. (laughs) Are you being serious? No. No. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Oh, I love that there's still mystery in our relationship, Bob. Mm, After all these years. After all these years. Yeah, Bob, I I think after last week, you know, with Lost in Translation, it's a movie that we were kind of okay with. Like, there wasn't anything great. There wasn't anything terrible. It just kind of was a, a little bit of a boring movie. And if there was the antithesis of a boring movie, it's Finding Nemo. 
you know, not to get too far into it right away, but I thought that the pacing of this movie was spectacular. You know, you, you get little lulls where you get to know the characters intimately, but it's always paced well with these action sets. And I think the most impressive thing that I'm just going to start right off the bat with, man, this movie is paced incredibly well. I think that's a really good point. And, and to your first point about it being the antithesis of boring, I think that it, it's not a perfect movie and we'll probably get into some critique and I think that if I do find one flaw with the movie, it's that I think sometimes it has too much plot. Like, it, it almost feels like it has to have an action set piece every scene. And by the end of the movie, I think they kind of complicate things more than it needs to be complicated just to kind of keep the suspense and the tension and the pacing going. But you're 100% right, Brad. The pacing of this movie, it's it's almost nonstop. But then you get these wonderful little moments of character building, and they're placed in just the right spots in the movie for it to really kind of land those emotional notes that it needs to land. All right, so Brad, I think most of our audience has seen this film. This is, I mean, any any Pixar movie is going to be well seen by our audience. But for those who haven't seen Finding Nemo or those who need a refresher, it's time for our favorite segment, Brad Explains. So Brad, can you break down the plot of Finding Nemo? Yeah, man. Nemo goes out and touches the butt and all hell ensues. <laughs> this really is a cautionary tale against assault, I think. I Yeah, I mean, it really Don't touch is. butts. Don't go to strip clubs. Don't <laughs> touch butts. You know, <laughs> it's just a bad, bad thing to do. Oh. <laughs> so Finding Nemo is about a young fish named, lo and behold, Nemo. He is the lone remaining child of Marlin, who is a clownfish. Uh, when Marlin and his young wife were about to have 500 little fishy kids, uh, Barracuda came and ate his wife and children, which is super bleak. <laughs> but it really is a, a downer of a beginning. It's a super downer of a, a, of a beginning, and, and Pixar is really good at that. I mean, you look at their other films like Up or you know all sorts of stuff, you're just like, man, they, uh, they hit you in the feels. So he loses all of his children, all 500 of them, except for one. Uh, he finds Nemo, who has a lucky fin that's a little bit damaged, uh, stunted, and so he's really protective of his one and only son. It's the last bit of family. Eventually, Nemo grows tired of this, and with some school friends, he swims out into the open ocean and is captured by a diver. And the diver takes him and puts him in his fish tank, and it turns out that the diver was a dentist. And so the rest of the movie is Marlin trying to find his way through the open ocean to try and find his son. And meanwhile, Nemo is in the fish tank with some new friends, and they're trying to help Nemo escape to get back into the open ocean to find his father. Yeah, it really is a movie that has a very simplistic plot. And it, in a sense, the movie, obviously, it's about finding Nemo, but it's also way more than that. It's a story about a father who's overprotective, learning to come to terms with what it means to trust people, to not have to be in control all the time. It really is uh, Marlin's journey as much as anybody else. Yeah, Bob, I think that the beautiful thing about this story is that you see growth happening from both Marlin and Nemo while they're separate from one another. You know, there's kind of this sense that while they're both there protecting one another, they're unable to grow. But when they have to face trials away from one another, that's when they grow. It's it's when they're taken out of their protection and put into a state of uncertainty and in a certain way suffering that that's when they really grow as characters. And I, I think it's a really fascinating story. I do too, Brad. And you know, we'll come back to talking about some of this more underlying stuff that's in the film. But before we get there, I think that the reason it's so successful is because of the quality of actors that they have in this movie. Oh, for sure. And I, I think, you know, this cast of voice actors, each one plays the role perfectly. They're super interesting. And I'm really curious, Bob, who is your favorite actor in this movie? Oh, man. I mean, it's it's hard to not say Ellen DeGeneres because she just steals the show. But that's also kind of what her character is supposed to do. You know, there's always a comic relief sidekick in a Disney movie like this. So I have to say, for, for anchoring the whole movie down, I'd probably have to go with Albert Brooks as Marlin. I think that his character has to go to some really deep, dark, emotional places. I think that he he nails the humor when it's necessary, but he doesn't let his character tip into being just, you know, a parody of itself. He always keeps the movie grounded in this chase, this search to find his son and bring him home. 
And I really was just impressed with the level of emotion in his voice all the way through the film. Yeah, I really think that Albert Brooks does a spectacular job as Marvin in this film. But you know who I actually think might have been my favorite performance? I loved Nigel the Pelican in this movie. <laughs> he was pretty great, I, wasn't he? Like, I beyond the the humorous, you know, a little bit of comedic relief that he brings... I thought that he just brought a lot of depth to the movie in kind of connecting the fish tank to the outside world. And when he's taking Marlin and Dory to see Nemo, and after they see Nemo lying supposedly dead in the plastic bag, and he takes him and he sets him back down, and he and he just says, "Man, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm so so sorry." I I don't know why, but his performance this time through just got me in the feels. I thought he did such a good job. Yeah, and not all of the performers in this movie really get a chance to shine or have moments like that that are written into the script. But like you said, Brad, this movie, the voice actors are perfectly cast. Even all of the fish inside the tank at the dentist's office, they just got the perfect voice actors for the character designs. No one really stuck out to me as like a sore thumb. Sometimes in, in animated movies like this, you get a voice that doesn't really quite match up with what the character is supposed to be. And I didn't find that at all in this movie. Everyone really played their part well, even if their their only job was to kind of serve the plot. I didn't think that anyone overdid it or underdid it. Yeah, I mean, you look at Willem Dafoe and Brad Garrett in the fish tank, and I was just blown away with how perfectly they hit the roles. Now, granted, it really was just Willem Dafoe and Brad Garrett being themselves, and you know, it wasn't a challenging script for them. But I thought that the roles that they gave them, I mean, it was it was just you know picture perfect for them to be who they were in this movie. Brad, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on Willem Dafoe's character Gil, because when they first introduce him. The way that he's introduced on screen, the music cues that come up, and then having that kind of sinister Willem Dafoe voice behind it, he's presented as a guy that maybe would end up being a villain in the movie. And he doesn't go that route. He actually really cares for Nemo, and he he helps him. I think at first, it's pretty clear that he has ulterior motives for wanting to get out of the fish tank. But as the movie goes on, those motives fall away, and he becomes very supportive of Nemo. And yet at the same time, I really thought that throughout this movie, if there was one character that was really underdeveloped and underwritten, it was Gil. You don't get a lot of backstory about him. And I think for, for a lot of the movie, Willem Dafoe is still playing him as if there's going to be this big twist or reveal towards the end of the movie that he's actually going to sabotage Nemo somehow. And I really struggled with his character because... I think they had a lot of opportunities to flesh him out more than they did, and they just never really used those opportunities. And it kind of made me wonder why it had to be Willem Dafoe in that role anyway, because at the end of the day, Gil doesn't really do much to help the plot along. And to get such a big name actor in that role, it, it almost felt like they underutilized Willem Dafoe in the movie. Oh, man, I... I didn't think we would have things to disagree on, but you just hit the nail on the head, Bob. I completely disagree. I think that Gil was a perfect character. I think that Willem Dafoe was a great choice. I, there's a sense that Gil obviously wants to get out of himself, but I think that he shows so much empathy for Nemo. I think that he cares about him very deeply. The way he's willing to sacrifice himself by you know shooting up on top of Darla's head I really enjoyed his character and how he helped Nemo escape. I, I, hmm. I'm i interested to hear that you, you thought he was underdeveloped. Yeah, I just, I, I thought that everything that he did in the movie was well done. I thought Willem Dafoe was great. I'm just surprised that they didn't give him a little bit more backstory, maybe one more brief scene where he kind of fills Nemo in on where he came from and what his motivations are, anything like that. He was really just there to help Nemo get out of that fish tank. And at the end of the day, like... He's not necessary to the plot. I don't need a ton of development for him. But I was—I think I was just expecting a little bit more when you have an actor as big as Willem Dafoe playing him. And I was surprised to see how little dialogue in the grand scheme of things they actually gave Gil. Yeah, honestly, the more I think about it, the more I think the reason you have Willem Dafoe play that character is because his voice is all the backstory you need. Willem Dafoe just has this world-weary voice. Like, honestly, the more I think about his voice, you know, let alone, you know, when he actually is an actor filmed in a live-action movie, 
his voice just has that film noir detective waiting for his next job kind of feel to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I I think that that kind of world weariness gives you all you need to know about the character of Gil. You know, the the way they designed him with the scars on his face and the fin that isn't gimpy in the way that Nemo's is, but it's been torn up. I would imagine it was torn up by an attempt to escape the fish tank at some point. There's something about that character that I think he was developed extremely well that by using the way he was animated and choosing Willem Dafoe as the actor that you get all the backstory you need without any exposition. Honestly, I think that the kid who played Nemo, and I I can't think of his name, it's Alexander something, I think. Okay. I really enjoyed Nemo a lot. I thought that for a child actor, he showed so much depth of character with his voice. Yeah, his range was incredible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. They picked a phenomenal actor for that role. I think that's a great point, Brad. And so often we don't really talk about child actors, especially in animated films, because they're not always given a lot to do. But Nemo as a character, he has moments of courage. He has moments of intense fear. He has moments where you see him grow. He has moments where he reverts to being very, very childlike and dependent. And I think that the voice actor for Nemo, he nails every single one of those notes. And it makes Nemo such an endearing character. I think that in the hands of the wrong actor, Nemo could actually verge on being kind of an annoying character. And the the quality of voice acting behind that character is what makes him endearing to the audience. Yeah, so the actor's name is Alexander Gould, and I've honestly never seen him in anything else, but man, oh man, he is so endearing as Nemo. You know, he has that childlike enthusiasm and wit, and there's just something so adorable about him that you go, yeah, he is so believable as a young, you know, I if we were comparing him to human terms, like, eight to nine-year-old maybe that's just enthusiastic about the world but at the same time still needs his family and i i think he does a spectacular job in that role so brad it sounds like we both really enjoy this movie and i think we'll definitely spend the latter half of this episode singing its praises and analyzing all of the depth that you can find in this movie but before we go to break I think it might be the best time now to maybe air some of our grievances with the movie or some of the nitpicks that we might have with it. So I want to start with you, Brad. Do you have any nitpicks with the way the film flows, with any of the acting, with any of the script that you want to get out in the open? Honestly, I'll start with the animation. I I still love the animation. I think it has aged mostly pretty well, but there's a few scenes, especially when they're really close up to Marvin and Nemo's face where I, I think the animation isn't holding up super duper well. I, I was, I'm kind of curious. What do you think about that, Bob? Yeah, I think that the underwater setting, it kind of helps them, it kind of helps them cheat a little bit because a lot of times what I really liked is when they, when they kind of get into murkier waters, the way that the Pixar animators really reflect uh, that sort of foggy light. I think that is perfect. And a lot of the environmental stuff is really great. Everything uh, with the shark sequence and the abandoned sea mine field is really, really great. But you're right, Brad. Some of the close-up details, the fish characters look more like plastic toys than they look like they actually have any sort of real flesh to them. And part of that may be the character design. They don't want to make them look too realistic or they won't be cute and fun anymore. But they look almost more like toys than they do like characters. Honestly, as we were talking about the animation, all I could think about was like a horrified, weird Disney live action version where everything is still CGI, (laughs) but it looks like super real. And I'm like, that would be terrifying. I don't want that movie at all. (laughs) I don't want that movie either. So one of my problems with the movie is that I don't think a lot of the jokes hold up. After 17 years, I think that Pixar has really learned how to be a lot more clever without relying on things like pop culture references. When I was watching, I I just made reference to that scene with the sharks at their sort of AA meeting. Mm -hmm. It's a really funny touch to add the AA meeting, but it's something that kind of goes over kids' heads. It makes parents chuckle. And I was kind of like, do we really need this story element? Right then. The meeting has officially come to order. Let us all say the pledge. I now a nice shark, not a mindless eating machine. If I am to change this image, I must first change myself. Fish are friends, not food. 
And then when Bruce gets a, a, a sniff of Dory's blood and, and comes after them, and they have that scene where he's trying to, like, ram in the door, and they, they put a Shining reference in there. And he says, yeah. here's Brucey. And I'm like, man, I cannot remember the last time a Pixar movie relied on a pop culture reference because typically their scripts are so airtight that they make their own jokes and they don't have to rely on brand recognition to get a cheap laugh out of the audience. And there were a couple times in this movie that I really thought that, especially in the first half of the film, there was just some unnecessary stuff. Yeah, Bob, I thought the exact same thing with the Here's Brucey. I was just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's The Shining. Got it. Neat. Yeah, like what did that add to anything, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's one of those things where adults in 2003 are very familiar with The Shining. So like you said, they go, ha, ha. It's like The Shining, where that guy wants to murder people. (laughs) Yeah, it just kind of seems like the cheapest way of getting a laugh out of the audience, like aside from a fart joke. And then this movie has fart jokes in it, too. It's just kind of (laughs) like you get the very best of what Pixar can do, and then you also get some of the laziest of what Pixar can do. You know, the scene where where, uh, Nemo first goes to school and he's meeting all his classmates, and they're like... You know, they're making a joke about how all these kids have different allergies. And it's like, haha, kids have allergies. We get it. The one the one kid is like, I'm H2O intolerant. And I'm like, OK, like, it's just <laughs> it's like they, they, they go one joke too far consistently in that yeah. first third first half of the movie. And I really did feel on this watch through that the movie didn't really find its footing until about the halfway mark. And then from that point on, I was like, this is perfect. This is a perfect movie. But that first half really was shaky at parts for me. You made me ink myself. <laughs> well, I will say at least that joke has a payoff later in the movie where the dad does the same thing at the end when the sharks come back. But like, yeah, you're, you're right. It's still a super cheap joke. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would agree, Bob. I think that the first half of the movie, they relied on gimmicks a little bit more than story. And so you get jokes like that. You get the AA meeting. I I will say, though, I think one of the best pieces of animation is when the blood enters Bruce's nostrils and that moment where you see his eyes, the pupils dilate completely turn black. black. That was spectacular. Yep, absolutely. But yeah, you're right. The first half of this movie, I, I think it does struggle a little bit. It's a little bit gimmicky. But once you get past... Uh, probably w- when Nemo tries the first time, you know, to make the tank dirty, he j- he swims up through the filter and puts the rock in. From that point on, you really see things start moving forward. Um, I think you could probably also pair that part. Once Marlin and Dory get onto the Eastern Australian current and they're with the turtles, and once they get past that, it's really gripping throughout the rest of the movie. I think one of the things that that did kind of frustrate me is the way that some of these characters are drawn so broadly. Like, oh, the turtles are surfers, so let's give them the most stereotypical surfer dialogue or dialect mm-hmm. in the world. And and that kind of stuff, after a while, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Even stuff like the way that all of the Australians talk, the fact that the guy lives on Wallaby Way, it's just like... I don't know if Pixar would make this movie the same way in 2020 that they made it in 2003. After watching the way that they dealt with Mexican culture in Coco and how how sensitive and how well informed they were to other cultures, watching them take on cultures like, you know, the surfing subculture or the culture of Australians. And it it was just like very, very stereotypical. And it did come across as a little bit lazy to me. And I just kind of wonder, like... How much better and how much more how much more subtle would this have been in 2020 as opposed to 2003? Yeah, I'm surprised that the dentist at one point wasn't eating a bloomin' onion from Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, he wasn't like smearing Marmite on everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bob, honestly, I hadn't even really thought about that a lot, but you are right. They just shove all of that in your face and it's very obvious. And I, I will say, I think part of it's, you know, played for jokes. I think that it's for kids to go, hey, you know, fist, noggin, dude. Yeah. Like, like that's a kid thing to enjoy. It's, and honestly. Yeah. And it's funny and it's cute. Oh, he lives. Hey, dude. Oh, what happened? Oh, I saw the whole thing, dude. First you were all like, whoa. And then we were all like, whoa. And then you were like, whoa. 
What are you talking about? You, Minnie Man, taking on the jellies. You got serious thrill issues, dude. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Oh, oh, my stomach. Oh. Oh, man. Hey, no hurling on the shell, dude, okay? Just waxed it. So, Mr. Turtle. Whoa, dude. Mr. Turtle is my father. Name's Crush. <laughs> but, like, when, I, when it was 2003 and I was 13... I enjoyed that stuff. Like, like that, that's the stuff that I had fun with from the movie. So I will say, I think they know their audience, but you are correct in saying, I think that Pixar has matured a little bit over the years in the way that they use jokes and the way that they use cultures. Uh, they've gotten better at still making kids laugh and making it a kid's movie, but just making it a little bit more mature. Yeah. And I think one of the most frustrating things for me is watching how even in the same scene, they'll go from some of the most clever things I've ever seen Pixar do and just super inventive, really imaginative to then including like the lowest common denominator joke. I keep going back to that sequence with the sharks. And as much as I love some of the touches, like you said, Brad, the, the shot of the pupils dilating and, and going all black and just the setting of it, like who would have thought to, to make one of their, their set pieces be an abandoned minefield? You know, like it was just so inventive and like, who would have thought of this? But then at the same time, its placement in the movie doesn't quite make sense to me because Nemo has literally just been kidnapped. He ran into Dory. And the very first thing that happens to them is they get kind of kidnapped by these sharks and taken to their AA meeting. And within five minutes, they put Marlin up on you know the stand and, and they're saying, like, tell us a joke. And Marlon's up there telling a joke. And I'm like, dude, your son literally just got abducted seven minutes ago. <laughs> it, it's just really weird kind of if there is a pacing issue in the movie. I think that's one of my problems with it is that sometimes we go from scene to scene with such like whiplash that it doesn't quite make logical sense that Marlon would be going along with it five minutes after his kid got taken away, you know? Yeah, Bob, honestly, I think when you were talking about the scene with all the mines and the abandoned submarine, it honestly reminded me of an old, old film that Don Knotts starred in called The Incredible Mr. Limpet. Have you ever seen that? No, I've never even heard of that movie before. You Man, I remember watching this as a kid. Don Knotts somehow turns into like a dolphin or some sort of fish creature, but he's still able to like communicate with humans. And so he like goes down and helps the U.S. military, like, see where, you know, my floating mines are and enemy submarines and, like, avoid shipwrecks and things like that. I For some reason, as I was watching Finding Nemo, it heavily reminded me of that movie. I, I'm 90% sure that that would have been an influence on this film. That's really interesting. And I guess my only question now, Brad, is why haven't we done that movie on the podcast? Because it sounds like an absolute masterpiece. Yeah, I don't know what we're supposed to be watching next week, but can it, man? We're we're watching The Incredible <laughs> Mr. Limpet, 1964. All right, well, I think I've gotten all of my grievances aired at this point. It it might be time for us to hit pause now, Brad, and try this Four Roses Small Batch Select. What do you say? All right, so today we're trying Four Roses Small Batch Select. Now, we are halfway through a flight of four Four Roses samples that were sent to us by our friend on Instagram, at Bourboneering. We've actually been working our way through these since last season. We have had these samples for so long that Bourboneering has changed his name. He used to be known as Bourbon in College. Now he's Bourboneering. So first of all, to our friend Bourboneering, uh, I'm sorry we didn't get through these quicker, but we wanted to space them out, and I'm really excited to try this small batch select. Brad and I have been kind of cooler on Four Roses in general. I'm not really a huge fan of their portfolio, so I'm anxious to see what this tastes like. As Bourboneering said, there are six of Four Roses' ten different recipes blended together to make this bourbon. It is a uh, no-age statement, which means it has to be at least six years old. I believe it's a blend of somewhere between six and seven years in age, and it's 104 proof, so it should pack a pretty good punch. Brad, what are you picking up on the nose of this 
small batch select. Well, let me give it a sniff and see what happens. Yeah, Bob, I'm not going to lie. I am smelling a decent amount of ethanol on this. I'm getting a little bit of vanilla. I'm struggling to get much else right now. Yeah, I don't think this nose has a lot going for it, Brad. Uh, there's there's a lot of alcohol in the nose, and I get a ton of wood. It's like oak and alcohol, and when I really try to find other notes in it, the only thing I'm really getting is pepper, and I think it's black pepper, like fresh, cracked black pepper. It's a very spicy nose. There's not a lot of sweetness to it, um, and the alcohol is very forward, which I'm kind of concerned about what this is going to taste like, given how harsh the nose on this is. But it does remind me of something like a Weller Antique. That one doesn't really have quite a, you know, a complex nose to it as well. So I'm going to stick at a six on this. I, I, I don't hate it, but it's not really giving me much to work with. Yeah, I'm going to go right in the middle. This is about a five. There's, I can tell something's going to happen, but it's not giving me enough to get me excited. All right, let's take a sip. Ooh, that is spicy. Man, this is this is really good, Brad. Um, when I first took a sip, immediately sweet on the front of my mouth. And I, I kind of like, you know, I chewed it a bit. And it's got those classic caramel notes. But even more than that, it's almost like a, like a toasted caramel, like a creme brulee or something. There's that layer of like, almost like a burnt caramel flavor to it. It's sweet all the way through the palate. I didn't find that it was harsh at all. I didn't really have the alcohol like pricking my tongue at all. It's got some pepper to it. It's got some spice. Uh, it's pretty viscous. It's a, it's a thicker whiskey. It coats your tongue well. And I just thought that all the way through, this was a pleasant experience. The oak comes out a little bit on the very back of the palate, but not in a way that dries your mouth out. It doesn't leave like a dry finish on your tongue. I really, really like the taste on this. I think I'm going to give it an eight and a half. Mm. Yeah, Bob, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I think there's that little bit of of sweetness on the front like you said, but to me it turns sour pretty quickly. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm getting kind of hmm, almost notes of rye on this. It, it's Well, it's a definitely really... a high rye bourbon. That's what Four Roses is kind of known for. Okay, well then I guess I'm not crazy cuz I'm sitting here thinking, "Man, why am I getting so much rye?" But yeah, if it's there, I'm really noticing a lot of rye on this, and I'm not enjoying it. That's really interesting. We're we're picking up almost completely opposite things on this whiskey. So what kind of a score would you give it, Brad? I think I'm going to give it a five again wow, on wow. the taste. Okay. I just I just think it's just okay. It's not impressing me in any you know specific category. Um, the finish it just keeps souring on me. I'm actually going to give it a four on the finish. I I think that the alcohol starts to come forward, which isn't a bad thing. It's not overpowering, but man, it just feels like it kind of starts sweet and then it keeps dipping down and down and down into that sour rye taste, and I'm not impressed. I am really shocked at how vastly different we are on this, and I'm wondering if like you know, whatever I ate today has my taste buds going one direction and yours going another because I'm having a completely opposite experience to you. I thought the finish on this might have been the most pleasant part of the whole thing. It's it, it's not dry. I actually made my mouth water more, which is something that I wasn't expecting given the amount of oak I picked up on the nose. It's really sweet. I think all the way through, you know, the tasting, it's it's kind of oily. It, it really coats my tongue well. The finish doesn't last long in my chest, which I really appreciate. Uh, it lingers for, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds on my tongue, so not a really long finish. And I didn't find anything in it that I really disliked. I think I would give this an eight and a half on the finish as well. So we're going to be way, way off on our scores today, Brad. Yeah, this might be one of our largest differentials in a, in a whiskey score. Uh, I'm curious, Bob, how well balanced do you think this whiskey is? I think that the taste and the finish are almost identical to me. Like everything I got in the taste carried through to the finish. It was a really pleasant experience. The nose was kind of lacking for me. And a lot of the notes that I picked up, you know, even now on the finish, I'm getting some of that sort of like caramely cheesecake flavor or that creme brulee that I got on the taste. And none of that was present on the nose. So I think that overall, I'd probably give it an eight on balance just because the nose was such a significant difference from the taste and finish. But after it touched my lips all the way through, I thought that it was a really consistent bourbon. Yeah, I would I would agree. I, I think that it's decently consistent, but it, it does start off sweet. For me it gets sour and then and then just kind of 
I don't know. You get that oakiness and woodiness and the rye flavor. I'm going to give it a six and a half on balance. It, it's decently well balanced, but I'm not overall impressed with any specific part. So I think this is where our scores are really going to diverge, Brad, because now we have to get into the value score. And we're, I think we're already about 10 points off from each other out of 40. But now we have to give this thing a score on value. And Bourbon Earring told us that he paid $65 for this. This is actually only available in a few states. I think Kentucky, Texas, California, New York, and Georgia. And Bourbon Earring was messaging with me about this whiskey. And he said that he paid cost for it for, from a friend that picked it up in Georgia for him. And that was $65. Now, for a guy like me who was really enjoying this, even I recognize that is a high price to pay. But I think when you factor in how limited the release is, that this is a very special occasion kind of whiskey, and then for a guy like me who really likes it, I can't give it a 10 because $65 is a lot of money. But I think I will give it a 7 on value. It's not something that you're going to reach for every day. It's definitely a special occasion bourbon. But knowing that, I think I'm more okay with paying $65 for it than I would if it was available like in all 50 states. Yeah, we're definitely going to be pretty far apart here, Bob. I'm going to give it a two and a half on value. You know, I, I think it is a unique whiskey. I can tell that it is high quality. I, I will definitely say that. You can tell that this is a well-made whiskey. I'm just not enjoying the flavor profile very much. I, I don't know what it is, but I don't feel like there's as much going on as there should be for a $65 bottle of whiskey. So yeah, I'm going to give it a two and a half. I'm struggling with this whiskey and, and I feel bad because I'm super thankful that Bourbon Earring, you know, threw this our way. What a guy. I mean, so, so thankful for him and his support of our show. But I will say this one, I, I you know, I'm just going to have to pass on. So that's actually bringing me out to a 38 out of 50 uh, or a 76 out of 100. This is one of my favorite whiskeys that we've had this season. I think I would pr probably only put it behind the Quinta Rubin from a couple weeks ago. I really, really enjoyed this, and Brad did not. What are you coming out to, Brad? Bob, I'm coming out to a 23 out of 50. Wow. Or a 46. Man, that's shocking. Yeah, I I am not not impressed with this. Like, like it's fine. I, I don't know. I could keep talking. It's just okay for me. I'm not impressed with it. I'm not going to recommend it. I, I don't think it's worth spending a pretty penny on. I'm really kind of bummed because that brings our average score to a 30.5 or a 61 out of 100. And, you know, I guess if I'm so effusive in my praise and Brad really doesn't like it, then I'm OK with it being in the middle because that's that's just how averages work. But in my opinion, this is way better than a 61 out of 100. I'm definitely going to recommend. I think if if you can find it, a bottle of it somewhere, it's worth picking up. But, you know. Because we're so widely different in our scores, maybe if you find it at a bar, try a glass of it. See what you think. We'd love to hear feedback on this from Film and Whiskey Nation. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and let us know what you think of Four Roses Small Batch Select. But in the meantime, you could listen to the rest of our podcast. <laughs> So, Bob, how about you say we get back to Finding Nemo? <laughs> I didn't mean stop listening and go do that. <laughs> oh, man. Let's get back into Finding Nemo, Bob. How about it? All right, so that was Four Roses Small Batch Select. We're back talking about Finding Nemo, and it's time for an abbreviated version of one of our favorite segments, Hot Takes. Hot Takes. This is where we read one-star reviews of the movies that we're talking about on the podcast and try to figure out if the people who wrote these reviews have any validity whatsoever. Spoiler alert, they do not. So, Brad, you have our hot take for the day. Why don't you tell us where it comes from? So, our first and only review is coming from username Mad Pig Mad Pig. And their review is titled, My God, this is not a children's movie. The average viewing public must be extraordinarily callous these days to not to be at least a little bit shocked by the movie's content. This film has the emotional elements of a Holocaust film with the overtones of a horror film. They should have named it Instant Nightmare in a Film Can. 
This is by far the most emotionally brutal cartoon I have ever seen, and the fact that it was marketed as a kid's movie is unbelievable. The movie begins when an entire family of fish, with the exception of the father and one of his sons, is slaughtered by what looks like a barracuda. When the son, Nemo, goes on a school field trip, he almost does something stupid because of peer pressure. His father then threatens to take him out of school, to which Nemo replies by doing something markedly stupider out of spite, resulting in his being captured by a diver and taken away in a boat. The father spends the rest of the movie following the direction of the boat went when it disappeared. During his journey, the father finds another fish with which he can have emotional issues and repeatedly encounters creatures that are introduced in a horrific enough fashion so that it probably kept hundreds of children's beds wet for weeks after the film's premiere. The combination of the odious, depressing characters and the slasher film-style directing-slash-music that most of the film seems to possess culminates in producing wastebasket fodder, even more potently unwatchable than The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from 2005. One star. Brad, I'm kind of surprised that we found any one star reviews of this movie at all. I thought this movie was pretty universally beloved. But I will say that I don't think that hot take is completely without validity. You know, even when we finished watching this movie, my wife asked me what I thought about it on this watch. And I told her and she said, you know, I was really surprised this time around at how sad this movie was. There's just a lot of sadness happening in this movie. And we had a really good dialogue back and forth about that. This is something that, first of all, you mentioned this already, Pixar is known for kind of bringing the, those sadder elements of life into their films. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that children's movies always have to be happy and goofy and bouncing off the walls. I think the moments of quiet in this movie and reflection, I think the moments where the parental figures have doubts and regrets. This is a movie that is as much for parents as it is for kids. And I think it's emotionally healthy for kids to see characters get sad on screen, to have to deal with some of the, the more complex issues of life, and that we're not hiding it from them until it's too late. You know, I, I really love that this movie can balance those two things, and I never saw that as a drawback. Yeah, Bob, you are 100% correct. I, I think that movies, you know, that are marketed for children have an opportunity to be so importantly educational and not in the sense of like learning that sea turtles can live to be 150 years old. I think that it's important that kids learn that life is going to have obstacles and that, you know, grit and perseverance are required you know, to get yourself through this world, because sometimes this world is a dark place. Sometimes bad things do happen. And if we're just going to, you know, shield our kids from that stuff, then they're going to be very unprepared when they, you know, go into the real world on their own. I think this might be a good time for us to kind of segue into talking about our analysis of the movie or some of the things that we saw underlying, you know, the main plot of the film. And the thing that really stuck out to me, and it may be because... I'm a dad and we're going to have another kid here soon. But like, I think more than any other Pixar film, this is a movie about parenting. I think sometimes people look at uh, Inside Out as a movie that's kind of about parenting. But it, when I compare the two, Inside Out is really a movie about growing up and navigating the emotions of uh, adolescence. And I think this movie is the one that's really for parents. Watching Marlon go on his journey of discovery you know, it's a journey to find his son. And I think even that is a metaphor. He's finding his son because his son got kidnapped, but he's finding his son in how he learns how to be a parent. He's finding that Nemo is capable of doing more than he thought he was. He's not handicapped, you know, by his, his special fin or whatever they call it. He's smart and he's inventive. And what it takes is Marlon learning to let go of his desire to be controlling and keep Nemo safe. And that's the lesson of the film is whether it's in friendships, whether it's in, you know, parenting, you have to be willing to trust other people. And you see it in the way that Marlon interacts with Dory and then later on in the way Marlon interacts with Nemo. And I think that's what makes this movie have such emotional heft for me is that it's it's someone discovering as much about himself as it is about, you know, finding out that the world is bigger than just him. <coughs> Daddy. Oh, thank goodness. Dad. I don't hate you. Oh, no, no, no. I'm so sorry, Nemo. Hey, guess what? What? 
turtles? I met one, and he was 150 years old. 150? Yep. Because Sandy Plankton said they only live to be 100. Sandy Plankton? Do you think I would cross the entire ocean and not know as much as Sandy Plankton? <laughs> he was 150. Yeah, and I think the scene that most clearly, you know, shows that growth is when they're in the whale and mm-hmm. Marlin is afraid that they're going to die, you know, and Dory keeps saying that she can speak whale and the whale tells them to let go, you know, and Marlin is sitting there holding onto the cliff and you have this sense of like, if we let go, we are going to die. And when Marlin asks the question, you know, how can I let go? How do I know it's going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And Dory just simply goes, you don't. You don't. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, the scene might be a little bit over the top, but it's just beautiful. Well, that's the thing. It's. It's it's on it's really on the nose. Like it's not subtle at all, but it's super necessary at that part of the movie. And I think you're right, Brad. It absolutely works. And it's the expression on Dory's face. It's that kind of blank smile that she always has. And she's like, you know, you don't know. And that's okay. And I think using Dory's limitations, if you want to call them that, her her short-term memory, it's not a gimmick. It really does play a huge role in the plot. And that's why I didn't mention it earlier when I talked about some of my problems with the script. They use Dory's short-term memory to such huge effect in this movie. And it's in that scene and then also in the scene where they go through the jellyfish. And they go through the jellyfish because Marlin is stubborn and doesn't trust her. And when they finally wake up and they've been rescued by the turtles... There's just this really nice, subtle moment where Marlin looks down and he sees that Dory has been scarred by what happened from the jellyfish. And there's no comment on it. And she doesn't even remember that it happened. And I really love that touch because I think really subtly what it's communicating is sometimes in relationships, whether it's a friendship or or any other kind of relationship, a short memory is a good thing. Like she forgot about what he did to her. And I think because she was able to kind of get over it like that. It helped Marlin grow as a person. And you're totally right, Brad, in that scene inside the whale, they use it to such great effect. And it really does catapult his growth as a character over the top. And I really love that you pointed out Dory's short term memory loss as kind of one of the better parts of this script. And I think it's so because, you know, there's this sense that Marlin is continually worried about the past And he's continually afraid about the future. Mm. And I think the big lesson that Marlon learns in this movie is that this present moment is the only moment that you truly have choice in. That you can't choose anything that's in the future. You can't choose about anything that's in the past. The only time that you have to make a choice to make your life better, to take command of where you're going and what's going to happen, is right now, right here, right in the present. Mm -hmm. And Dory is so vociferously in the present that it forces Marlin to come face to face with his fear of the future, with his worry about the past, and he has to make choices that matter. He has to make choices that will take him closer to his son continually. And you see him grow and realize, I can't shape the future or the past. I can only shape this present moment that I'm in. And I think that that's a beautiful message that helps anyone who watches this movie to understand, man, don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the past. Like, take control of your own life now. There's one more thing that I really thought this movie did well that I never really noticed this layer of it before, and I want to call our attention to one more scene, and it's the scene where Dory finally gets her emotional moment, and I honestly had forgotten completely about it, and when it happened in this this watch-through, it brought a tear to my eye. She looks at Marlin when they think that they've lost Nemo for good. When they see him in the dentist's office, they get dropped back off in the in the harbor by the Pelican, and Marlin's like, I'm going home now. And she starts begging him, please don't go, please. Stop! Please don't go away, please. No one's ever stuck with me for so long before. And if you leave, if you leave, I just, I remember things better with you. I do. Look, P. Sherman, 42, 42, I remember it. I do. It's there. I, I know it is because when I look at you, I can feel it. And and I, I look at you and I, 
I'm home. Please. I don't want that to go away. I don't want to forget. And she says, you know, when I look at you, I'm home. I remember things better with you. I don't. And basically what she's saying is like, I don't have anybody else besides you. And it really kind of nailed home to me the message of this movie, which is none of us kind of know what we're doing any more than anybody else. And it's a message that gets hammered into Marlon time and time again by Dory's constant presence of forgetting things. When he's talking with the turtle about parenting and he says, you know, you never really know, man. It's a constant reminder. It happens inside the whale when he learns how to let go without knowing what's going to happen. And I think in that moment, they're using Dory to kind of hammer home the point that, you know, Dory is kind of the extreme of this situation where she doesn't know what's going to happen from moment to moment. And she can't remember what brought her here. But Marlon learns in his own way that parenting is just like that. None of us know what we're doing. We're all just trying to do the best that we can. And that's okay. And we're all kind of getting through life together with that understanding. And it's kind of liberating and kind of freeing when you understand that all of us are in this together and we're all just trying to figure it out as we go. And I thought that was a really, really beautiful touch that kind of anchored the movie down for me. Carpe diem, film and whiskey nation. Go out and seize the day. So, Brad, you know, uh, this movie makes me emotional every time I watch it. I'm not even going to get into talking about the very last scene. I do think that it reinforces that idea of Marlon's watching Nemo kind of swim out into the unknown, into the abyss, into the deep again. But he has that confidence that his son is growing, that he's growing, and that it's all going to be okay. And with that in mind... I think it's time for us to get to our scores for this movie. Before we get into scores for the movie, I first want to say, if you want to hear Bob talk more about the final scene of the movie, go back and listen to our top five animated voice acting performances. It was done way long time ago, but we talk about Finding Nemo. We sure so go do. Go on back and check that out. And I made, I made sure to cut out the part where I started crying in studio talking about that movie. Yeah, Bob, I'm glad that I brought the tissues for that episode. <laughs> But I want to I'm curious if you heard what I heard when the very end of the movie, the final, you know, set piece when they're they're teaching the fish to swim downward to escape the fishing net. Did you think that the music there sounded almost exactly like the Shawshank Redemption at the very end of the film when he escapes and he's under the thunderstorm? I thought that the music score for Finding Nemo was eerily similar to Shawshank Redemption. Wow, Brad, I wonder why that might be. Yeah, I I don't have any idea. Could you illuminate for us why that might be? Well, maybe it's because Thomas Newman was the composer of this movie. And we know wah, 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 wah. <laughs> we've already talked about how I think a lot of his scores sound the same because there are moments in this movie. I think when we're first getting introduced to uh, when Nemo is first going to school, that remind me a ton of his score for American Beauty, too. So Thomas Newman is springing up again and again. I do think his his score is is absolutely lovely. I think that the Nemo theme, you know, when when Marlon first picks up Nemo's egg and is talking to it and then it's the same theme they play at the end of the film when he's sending Nemo off to school. It's really beautiful. The strings are incredible. But you're right, Brad. There's there's a lot of callbacks to other Thomas Newman movies. I just wanted to make sure we got that in there. Yeah. But Bob, what's your final score? As I watched it this time, the first half really was a struggle for me. And I was like, you know, it's still a well-made movie. It still means a lot to me. I'd probably give it like an eight to an eight and a half. But as I watch the end of the movie, the last half hour especially is just perfect filmmaking. I just, I love every second of it. And if I was just reviewing that part, I would be like, oh man, it's like a nine and a half or a 10. There are a lot of critics that think that this is Pixar's best movie. Um, when Time Magazine made their list of the 100 best films of all time, they only let one Pixar movie in and it was Finding Nemo. I have never quite been that much of a defender of Finding Nemo. I think it's a great movie, but I'd probably still put like at least two or three Pixar movies above it in my mind. I think I'm going to give this movie a nine out of 10. There are things about it that don't hold up perfectly, but it still is, it's just a fantastic movie. There's not much to nitpick here. And I think it does almost everything to the best possible level that it can. So I'm going to give it a nine. Yeah, Bob, I'm kind of in the same vein as you. This is a great movie. You know, there's certain things that don't hold up well, like here's Brucey, and uh, the animation's a little bit 
you know, kind of dated. I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of 10. I think that this is a spectacular movie. The message in it is beautiful. I think that Marlon learns an extremely important lesson that a lot of audience members probably need to learn too. So I, I love Finding Nemo. It's funny. It's fresh. You know, even now, almost 20 years later, I loved watching this movie. It, it's it's so much fun, and I would highly recommend it to anybody who wants to watch it. All right, but we want to know what you think, so please get on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216 800 5923. Call in, let us hear your voice on Finding Nemo. Next week, we're going to be switching gears pretty hard, Brad. We are going to be talking about the 1999 M. Night Shyamalan classic, The Sixth Sense. You know what, Bob? They are less far off than you think because these were two spectacular child acting performances. That's true. That's true. I'm excited to get into it for the Film and Whiskey podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. We'll see you next time. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 216-952. I'm giving out my own phone number. (laughs) Our phone number is... I was really confused because it was so far off. I was like, where are you getting this combination of numbers, Brad? (laughs) If if you want to give me, Brad G, a call, (laughs) well, I'm not giving the rest of my number.